Well, after nearly 20 years of preaching, I'm about to preach a sermon this morning based on a single word that I've never preached on before. It is, of all things, a preposition, a simple two-letter word that is of such common use in our daily vocabulary that we don't even think about it when we're using it. We use this word all the time. It's a word that is easy to overlook. In fact, it's in that passage that Angela just read for us in Paul's letter to the church in Rome. It's in a very important phrase that caught John Wesley's attention and made it such an impression on him that he used that phrase as an integral part of his definition of what it means to be a Christian. The phrase was this, the love of God has been poured into your hearts. If you blink, you'll miss the word, but it's there. A simple preposition that John Wesley interpreted to unlock a whole new character of his understanding of Christianity. And it's the basis for my sermon today. What's that word? The word is of. Of. So I'm going to try to preach a whole sermon based on that two-letter word, of. Now, on first glance, we think we know what Paul is saying here to the church in Rome. Seems pretty clear that when he's talking about the love of God, he's talking about the love that comes from God and that has been poured into our hearts. God is the source of that love, and it's been generously, lavishly bestowed upon all of us. So in that case, the word of in the phrase love of God indicates that the love comes from God, just like when you say the love of your parents. You're talking about your parents' love for you. Or on this day, Valentine's Day, you're talking about the love of your spouse or the love of your significant other. You're talking about the love that comes from that person. But notice that when you translate that word of into English, all of a sudden there's a whole new layer of meaning and it becomes a little more ambiguous as to what that phrase might suggest. After all, when you're talking about, for example, your love of country, you're talking about the love that you have for your country, not from. When you're talking about, for example, your love of baseball or the Bucks or the Lightning, you're talking about the love you have for those teams and those sports, not from them. So which is it? When we talk about the love of God, which was a foundational element in Wesley's understanding of Christianity, which is it? The love that comes from God to us or the love that comes from us to God. Is God the source of that love or the recipient of that love? Is God the subject of that love or the object? And it becomes very clear to John Wesley as he sat down one day to write an essay called The Character of a Methodist, one of his most important essays that he ever wrote, that for him, those two options, those two understandings of that preposition of are not mutually exclusive. In fact, both are important to John Wesley. And you can't have one without the other. You can't fully understand God's love for you unless you love God, and love others in return. And that is the essence of his understanding of Christian character, that you can't love other people unless you fully understand and accept God's love for you. And frankly, that can be a very, very hard idea to understand just how much God loves you. 
back in 1966. There was a book that was published that caught very little fanfare at the time, but by the end of that year, the book had sold half a million copies. The book was called Children's Letters to God, and the author of that book had a very simple premise, just collect letters, actual letters that children had written as prayers to God, compile them all together, and put them in this beautiful little book. And by the end of that year, that book had sold like wildfire as children's letters to God captured some beautiful and poignant and often humorous letters, such as this one from a little girl named Joyce who wrote in her letter, Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy Or a letter to God from a little boy named Larry. Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would not have killed each other if they had their own rooms. (laughs) Larry says, it works with my brother. But then of all the letters, this one caught my attention the most. From a little girl named Nan. Nan wrote, Dear God, I bet it is very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in my family and I can never do it. <laughs> Little Nan asks a question that all of us have probably wondered, occasionally pondered in our own lives about the nature of God's love. How in the world could this God love not just everybody, did you notice the way she phrased it in her letter? Not just everybody in the whole world, but all of everybody in the whole world. All of what makes us human, the good stuff as well as the bad stuff. How could this God love all of everybody in the whole world? You spin it out even farther, you realize just how profound Nan's question really is. How could this vast and transcendent God, this God who created all things into being, this Lord of the universe, the one who's, by whose very word all things came into existence, this majestic, infinite, transcendent God, how could that God love us? How could this God who is so righteous, so pure, so perfect, unblemished in every way, how could this holy God love even the most vile, the most sinful and broken person in the whole world and even love the wickedness that's inside all of us? How could this God who is so infinite boundless, limitless, love us with a love that is so lavish and generous and love even such finite and frail and faulty creatures as us. Got to love Nan's question because it's a question that all of us can wonder. Dear God, dear God, How can you love all of everyone in the entire world? I mean, we even struggle to do that with members of our own family. And I suspect that before I go any further in this sermon, this is the entry point for so many of us this morning in the sanctuary for the sermon today. As many of you may be sitting there in your pew in the sanctuary and wondering to yourself, how can God love me? With all of my past, with all of my sinfulness, with all the things that I've done, even with all the things that I'm struggling with right now, how can this God love me? 
Maybe there are some of us this morning who are having a really hard time trying to get a grip on what unconditional love, that unconditional love of God looks like because you have never experienced unconditional love from anyone else especially from those people that you thought would unconditionally love you. Those relationships have proven to be faulty and broken, full of betrayal. And it's put you on edge. And so you have never been able to understand anything close to an unconditional love. Maybe you've been broken so much in your life that you, by other people who have wronged you, that you can't possibly understand how God could love the perpetrator of such harm and such wickedness in the world, even and especially when you have been that perpetrator yourself. Oh, it's hard. It is hard to get our heads around a love so amazing, love so divine, this love of God that has been poured into your heart. How can we possibly accept that or understand that or believe that today? One of my favorite children's stories that I used to read to my children back when they were very young is a book that perhaps many of you have read at one point. It's called The Runaway Bunny by Margaret Weiss Brown. When I read that story to my girls, little did I know that when I had that book in my hand, I had more than a child's story in my hands. I actually had a theological textbook in my hands too. Because I want to share with you a few excerpts from that story, but this time, don't think about the little bunny and the mother bunny in the story as being part of a child's fable. Think about it in terms of your placement in the story as the little bunny who wanted to run away and God as the mother bunny. Once upon a time, there was a little bunny who wanted to run away. So he said to his mother, I am running away. Well, if you run away, said his mother, I will run after you, for you are my little bunny. Well, if you run after me, said the little bunny, I will become a fish in a trout stream, and I will swim away from you. Now, if you become a fish in a trout stream, said his mother, I will become a fisherman, and I will fish for you. If you become a fisherman, said the little bunny, I will become a rock on a mountain high above you. Well, if you become a mountain, a rock on a mountain high above me, said his mother, then I will be a mountain climber and I will climb to wherever you are. Well, if you become a mountain climber, said the little bunny, then I'm going to join the circus and I will fly away on a flying trapeze. Well, if you go flying on a flying trapeze, said his mother, then I will be a tightrope walker, and I will walk across the air to you. Well, if you become a tightrope walker and walk across the air, said the bunny, then I will become a little boy, and I will run away into a house, If you become a little boy and run into a house, said the mother bunny, then I will become your mother and I will catch you in my arms and I will hug you. Shucks, said the little bunny. I might just as well stay where I am and be your little bunny. And so he did. And the mother bunny said, have a carrot. Oh, before we go any further, let's underscore that the Bible is very clear about one definition of of. It is the love that God has for you. A love that is infinite and high and deep and wide 
And there is nothing that can separate you from that love that has been poured out into your hearts. Not trickled into your hearts, not dabbed into your hearts, not just sprinkled into your hearts, but poured lavishly, generously into your hearts. You are the recipient of the grandest and greatest love that the world would ever know. God loves you. But John Wesley would want to go one step further. He recognized in that little preposition that there is a flip side to God loving us, and it is none other than the fact that if God loves us, then we need to love God and love others as well. In the first passage that Angela read for you this morning, it begins with the Pharisees asking Jesus a question. Jesus, what is the greatest commandment of them all? Of all the commandments that were given to us by Moses, of all of the laws that define our faith, what is the single most important action that we can take? What is the one most important thing that we must do, Jesus? What's interesting is the way that Jesus answers that question. He answers it by saying, love. Love is the most important thing. But let's be clear, when Jesus is talking about love in this case, he is not talking about February 14th love. He's not talking about Valentine's Day love. He's not talking about candy hearts and diamond rings and chocolate roses. He is talking about a kind of love that is so much deeper and so much more, and requires so much more of us than those things. He's talking about a love that encompasses more than just sentimentality and romance. Because when he says that we need to love God, he goes further and says, we need to love God with all of our hearts and our soul and our mind and our strength. He's not just talking about a sentimental love or an affection that we need to have for God. He is talking about a love that encompasses our entire being, which is why, by the way, when he talks about loving God, he begins by saying, by loving God with our hearts. And in the Greek language of the New Testament, that word heart is layered with meaning. The Greek word for heart is cardia, which we often associate with cardiology or cardiac, related to that singular organ in our body that pumps blood throughout all of our body. But in the Greek world, cardia meant more than just that fleshy organ that is in the center of our chest cavity. It actually meant the entirety of one's being, all of one's thought life, all of one's actions, all of one's behaviors, all of one's instincts and perspectives and priorities. When you talk about loving God with your heart, it means everything that belongs to you is now directed and channeled toward God. Which means that we not only have to love God visibly with our actions and our behaviors, we must also love God with that parts of our character that no one else can see. The thoughts that you think that no one else can know. The actions that you perform that no one else can see. The things that you do behind closed doors in the privacy of your own room that no one else can possibly notice, that must be directed to God as well. Which means, ultimately, when we talk about a love of God, a love that we must have for God, it encompasses not just our actions, but also our character. That which governs us when no one else is watching. And so, when John Wesley sat down to write one of his most important essays, the one called The Character of a Methodist, He talked about both kinds of of. The love that God has given to you 
and the love that we give to God that encompasses every aspect of our being. And that is what is going to guide our Lenten journey this year. When John Wesley sat down to talk about Christian character, he talked about it in five different ways. And he laid it out for his followers as if to say, if you can go five for five, if you can work on all five aspects of your character, then you will fulfill that part of the commandment that says that we need to love God and love others. And what are those five ways? Well, in fact, those five ways are going to be the contents of the sermon series over the next five weeks. One, we love God. That's today. We love God. Two is next week. We rejoice in God. Three, we give thanks even when times are tough. Four, we pray constantly. And five, we love other people. Now, I don't know about you, but I am certainly short in terms of fulfilling all five of those. It is hard to go five for five in realigning our character according to the love of God. And that's why this Lenten journey is so important for all of us today, because my suspicion is there's at least one of those categories that you need to work on this morning and throughout your Lenten journey. The good news is you're not alone. And the even better news is that you are going to have a guide to direct you along this journey. This little book called Five Marks of a Methodist is written by a dear friend of mine. It's a book that is based on that essay by John Wesley called The Character of a Methodist. And it's written by a man named Steve Harper, who is one of the preeminent professors of spiritual formation and Wesley studies in the country. And the cool news is, he's local. Lives just down the road, down I-4 in Orlando. He wrote this book. It's been spread like wildfire across the Methodist connection, and it'll be available for you starting Wednesday in the bookstore. And what's even better is that we would love for you to join a small group over this Lenten season where you all will learn about the contents of this book and try to go five for five in aligning your character around the love of God. And what's really cool is that Dr. Steve Harper is going to be here next Sunday as a special guest preacher in the sanctuary. I would love for you to get to know him through his reading and through his preaching as we all strive to discover the love of God that has been poured out into our hearts. What would people see? What is it that people would see if they somehow were to pull back that facade, that mask that we so cleverly wear at all times to impress other people, to project an image of that which we really are not. What would they see if they pull the mask down? Here's what I think they would see. They would see a child that God loves very, very much, a recipient of God's powerful and boundless and limitless love. But here's the question. Would they see a heart that is right and aligned with God's love? Would they find a character that is pure and just? Would they find a person that is rejoicing at all times and a heart that prays constantly and a mind that gives thanks in all things? I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of work to do in those five areas. And this is the perfect journey for us to be on together. Welcome to Lent. Let's take this journey together.